very general. Women in the church, which can go in a million different directions and how they serve the church. But I could think of no better person to be the one to speak about this. Matshkai Reen, some of you know, is the wife of a priest and a priest who has traveled throughout the country in the last few years serving different parishes. So they have a good idea of different communities and how they work. And being the daughter, the daughter of a priest as well, I know how important a matchka is to the priest. Matchka, this matchka, Ruth alluded to it a little bit earlier. They're really the backbone of the parish in so many ways and the support for the priest that he needs. So it's a very important role and you need someone who's very insightful and compassionate and caring. And I think she'll speak about that and also in how women in the church and the role they have to play. Beyond that, her father was a priest. And so, growing up, she stood, they lived in four different parishes, so got to know different communities that way. So she had a very faithful family. So I'm sure she has a lot of stories to tell about both how kids should be raised in the church, and then how women can help strengthen their families and their, and their husbands in that search for a stable of things. So much gratitude. So I just want to say, when Mother Gavi called me and said, I'd like you to give a talk, and like, Mother Gavi had nothing to say. <laughs> usually, usually you have monastics at these talks um, and giving wonderful insight, but now she's asking me. So I just uh, was sharing with Rachel, I said, you know, I don't know. And Mother Guy says, talk to Christina Montfort. Like, so I call her, Christina's very encouraging. <laughs> you can do this, I'll help you out. I'm like, okay, that's great. So here we are. And then I had said to myself, someone said to me, she said, you know, you're a young old woman. I said, yes. Yes. No, but actually it was very true, right? If in your decades, if you look at your different seasons of life, you know, I'm in my 60s, so you are a young woman. Because then there's a middle-aged old woman, and then there's a the old old woman. Just as it says in the song. So I'm like, okay, I, I can do that. So I said, if not now, and if not, it's not going to be me, well, who's it going to be? I'm like, well, anyone here could probably give a talk and talk about um, your experiences and how you came to orthodoxy. So I don't really have any answers for you all. I just will share on reflections over life. And so as Mother Agape asked me to talk, I said, well, what am I going to talk about? How can you take this um, in such a parish to say, Maximus Ali, who gather, who've gone on your own searches, and so I thought about all of the Nostavniki, all the teachers in my life, and they've been absolutely amazing. It's from my parents, from the various parishes. We lived in Syracuse, New York, as our first parish where we grew up. And it once was 115 West End Drive. And there was a monk's nester living there. I'm not sure why he wasn't in Jordan, but he was living at the parish. And I remember there were two instances, so I'm like five years old at the time. And so this is just to be reminded, when you see a five-year-old, just be mindful of what you say to them, because they could remember for the rest of their life. It stays with you. That's right. So once I was running down the driveway, I fell and I cut myself, and he said, see, that's because you ran away from your mother. <laughs> you don't have to do what, what she told you to do. I'm like, yeah, obedience issue from a young age. Okay. Check, you're right there. And then once in church, we were there, and this was back, so this would have been like in the 60s. And people usually would pull out a dollar bill or two dollars and put it in the plate as they went around. Well, after church one day, I saw people out a 20 and put a 20 in the plate. And afterwards, I said, Father Nestor, I said, like, you know, wow, like, why are you putting so much money in there? And he said, he said, well, I opened my wallet and that's all there was. So you have to put in what you had in your wallet. I'm like, mm -hmm. And you know, and to that, that day, for some reason, I remember this. My mother says, you remember such minutia. Well, for some reason, it struck a young mind that that's what it was. 
And it's, it was an it's a lesson, such a small thing, how it affected my thinking for the rest of my life. Go figure, this, this one person. We're also very blessed uh, with, if you know your geography, New York State, New York Thruway runs straight across northern New York State. And we're living in Syracuse. So the bishop would travel many times over from Jordanville, then through Syracuse over to Buffalo, and then Rochester, and then back. Oftentimes, they, someone would stop, and there were some wonderful monks there. Um, and they would see we had a large family, not much money. And they say, oh, they need some bed. They would drive to Jordanville, get the furniture, and bring it back so that we had an extra bed. You know, these are the things that the monks would do. Uh, once, on vigil, we had, it was a bishop service. And I knew, as a kid, when the bishop comes to your house, you had, my mother brought up special bedding just for the bishop. She prepared for days for the bishop because after the service, the bishop would come and have dinner and tea at our house, and then do it overnight. <clears throat> well, this one time the bishop's coming, it must have been in December, because it was dark and cold in Syracuse. For the parish feast. For the fit parish feast, yeah. that's right. And my mother's not doing all these preparations. I'm like, oh, okay, something's different. So, and she decided, you know, when the, someone, the extra priest, that she go to a confession, so she would go and she stayed, she sent the kids home with someone. So I came home, before microwaves, I'm heating the milk for the bottle, for someone's bottle. You know, we had seven kids in the family. And uh, burnt the milk on the stove, gas stove. Smoke everywhere. I mean, it's just crazy. Then there's a ring at the door now. And who is it? It's Bishop Avierki standing at the door. <gasps> and I remember thinking, this is not good. <laughs> My mother's not home. She hasn't been preparing, and there's the bishop standing at the door. <laughs> and come to find out, there were there was not conflict. There was you know troubles between the choir director and my father, who was the priest. My father was a very peaceful man. He's like, you know, whatever you want, we'll do. And the bishop uh, and the choir director said the bishop's staying at my house. I was like, great. You know, less work for my wife. You know. So what did the bishop do? This is what a bishop did. He went to the, the choir director's house. He overnight, he had his tea, and he said, now take me to the priest's house. Oh, my show is in charge. To show who's in charge. And you just knew who's in charge. And you know, my, mom, my mind went totally blank after that, because I just knew it was a bad situation. And the choir director comes in and says, what's all this with all the smoke in the house? What's going on? I'm like, this is bad. And then the bishop sat down and waited for my parents to come home. Wow. 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 You know? So these are things, sort of the formative things in the year that you don't even know how, how they affect someone. Um, but they're all in there, and they come back when you start reflecting on what one's experience is in life. Um, so that's why I tell you it's very good that Mother Agapia tw twisted my arm to give this talk, because it forced me to really reflect and to see what was going on. And one of the things, the common threads with people who were strong in their faith, they're always very real people, and they're always joyful. And we can't forget in our seriousness to be joyful. Right? It's because they never really forced anything on us. They were just, they were examples. And that's what you sort of learn. It's always good to educate, um, but that was one of the things that, if you look at all the people over time, it's the joy. So that's something that we try to cultivate. Well, we try. So one of the things also that came to mind, and I came very late to this, is that for women to serve, before you can serve anyone, you have to make sure you're serving God yourself. And it's sort of like when you're flying in the plane and they say put on your air mask, your oxygen mask first before putting on any wellnesses, you have to put your own on. And I was sad to say with all of this experience, going to church, you know, doing what you're supposed to be doing, it was only in my 40s that I came to this. And so someone spoke earlier that everyone has to be converted, you have to be converted yourself. You have to come realize that this is important, this is something that you need to do to fuel yourself. Because if you don't fuel yourself, then you can't really help others. And taking that time out to fuel yourself will give you that energy. And I said, I think to Christina yesterday, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens you or gives someone uh, yeah, to yeah. 
And it's true, because you think that, like, oh, I can, you know, like, there's no way I can do that. And then if you say, well, take it out of your hands and put it in God's hands. And then it's amazing what you can do. So that's, that's another thing. And so what did I start doing in my 40s? I said, you know, I have to start really reading scripture, not just the daily scripture readings, um, but, but delving a little deeper. And so to, to read out through the New Testament, I haven't got through the Old Testament yet, um, but just to start reading that and to, to contemplating that in addition to the morning prayers, just to take that time out. And at first, you know, nothing really, I mean, I would read, read some explanations. I have a notebook, I would jot things down on the notebook. And by doing that, you know, they say that to develop, it's to develop the habit. When you develop the habit, that even if it gets stale, you can refresh it. And it's easier to refresh an old habit, a habit, than starting from scratch from zero to 60. Mm -hmm. It just is. So this was a while ago, and that's the best thing I could have done in my life. And I wish I started earlier. You know, when you're young, you're a college student, and you're, you know, you're, you're mind some, you're like, oh, I'm too busy living, or this and that. Then you have kids, and they're like, oh, like, I'm way too busy. And you just don't think about it. But then you start getting on empty. And you have to fuel yourself. You have to put something in so you can give back out, so you can serve others. Um, and so by doing those things is that we have to remember. And what happens, I'll speak for someone who's in my season of life, I know there are other women in different areas at different parts of their life, is that sometimes you've had a bad night and you're tired and you get up and you're just not connecting. You're like, you know, I'm not sure that I really, I'm not feeling anything today. Well, guess what? You're not going to feel everything every day. You just have to do it. And feelings can be dangerous because you can also like feel the other way. So you have to say, no, this is my discipline, and I'm going to do this as a discipline. Because by having that discipline, you're also not doing something just because you feel like it. You know, that's what times is all about, right? It's like not to give in to anything what we feel like doing. Because a lot of times we don't feel like doing anything. Right. And so sometimes it's harder to get, like if you're tired, you can say, oh, I'm not going to do this now, like I'm too tired. No, you have to say, no, I'm really good. Light your candle, be in front of your icon, say, no, I'm, I'm really going to do this. And to sit down before reading scripture, perhaps read some spir a spiritual book, like a selection from that, just to get your mind focused, not your to-do list, which I'm very guilty of, like, okay, what do I have to do to your mind? Like, no, give God the glory when you wake up. Just to say something out of the, um, I did write down some verses from the, I think it's one of the hours of, the, of this first hour. Like, in the morning, hear my voice, my King and my God. And you're lying in bed, just make a sign of the cross. And just say that very positive. Just to focus yourself on it. Because it's too easy to get up in your responsibilities for the day. You're, you're already probably active. You're trying to do good things. Well, you know, Martha and Mary, you have to make time for both. You can't just be one and not the other. Uh, so to think about doing that. And when you make it that daily habit, then it becomes a solace. And you want to continue doing it. And some of the things that I have done in my time, it's after reading the selection. It's wonderful because then things start coming back to you. One year as part of the selections, what we did is we read through uh, the book, the book, the 118th Psalm, what just verse by verse. I could only do one verse a day, and that was that was sufficient. But then I found, after having gone through that, when we're reading the 118th Psalm of St. Nicholas, it's like an old friend. When you read the Psalm, things come back to you. You may not know, remember all the details, but it's in your soul, and it comes back to you. And that's what becomes very powerful is when it's not just streams of words going by you, but they actually start meaning something to you. And that's what's been over the years, is that it does become yours. It becomes more real. And every time you read it, you're like, oh, I remember that. Or even better is when thoughts of scripture come to you in a situation. Oh, that's like amazing. Because that just takes being, I know else would be familiar, to be familiar with it so that you do want, because God's grace is sufficient, and we have to rely on that instead of our own, thinking our own powers. Whenever we try to rely on your powers, it's not going to happen. It's, 
just, it's just, it's limited. <coughs> I heard there's some people, if there are young people, sometimes they'll say, well, and we don't see how time we can fritter time away. Also, as a young old woman, I can realize that time is short. It might be the last car that I buy in my life. Well, you know, that's, that's a wake up call. You know, or maybe it's the last coat I ever need to buy. You know, thing, things like that. So, it's, so time is different as you get older. Um, it's, you know, you can waste so much time on the internet. I mean, before it used to be just magazines going on. People would say to me, like, yeah, you don't really read novels or anything like that. I'm like, yeah, well, why not? You know, just, I'll just read them. Like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> and it's not because, it's because you want to pursue something different, is what it comes down to. And that's what, by reading more of God's word and trying to, figure out what, you know, when the fathers talk about things, it just comes to light and it brings to mind. And it just, it fills the soul in ways that nothing else can. So I just definitely encourage you all as you go on your life to, to continue on. I'm sure you're all doing something. Um, so to continue doing that. Oh yeah, but while, if we're feasting on all these other things, like internet, whatever else people do, the movies, if we keep doing that, we're not gonna have an appetite for God's word. We're going to, that's, it's going to, our minds are going to be pulled in that direction. So that's why Lent's a really great time just to curb some of that extra distraction. And there, before Lent, with trepidation, you like, oh my gosh, great, Lent's coming. I'm not sure. This, I'm up for this. Because you've got lax to say, oh, well, Lent's coming. I can do it then. Or, you know, I'll do this now because Lent's coming. Well, that's <laughs> not really a good way to live. And so when Lent comes, you're like, I'm not sure I'm ready for this because I've sort of like loosened everything up. So Lent's just a wonderful gift that we have to really pull ourselves back and out of the world and out of the world. It, it, it gives us a framework. And if you start just with a slight pattern pulling yourself back, it becomes easier as you get older. And then you almost don't want the distractions. And you'll say, if someone asks you, do you want to go out? I'm like, well, maybe we'll do that after Pascha. You just, because if they're not orthodox, and you're going with them, then they don't really understand where you are. Um, but you can also use that as time to minister. So, but someone, uh, we were talking to a monk, and he said, well, you know, great lens starting, so I'm going into, is it the water? I guess it's recluse? How would you say seclusion? Seclusion, seclusion. He says, I'm going to seclusion. So even if we have families, we can go mentally, like, obviously we have our responsibilities that we need to face. But we can go and just quiet everything down and set an example. Set an example for people. Oh yeah, and then if some of you haven't been reading reading scripture, and one of the things that I was overwhelmed when I had started that, just to read beyond like the daily readings and things. There's a wonderful book called the Green Book that gives you little excerpts from what the fathers say about each reading. That's a very good. Um, but I found that if something struck me, I would write it down in a notebook. And it, that's really neat because that becomes like a journal of the years. And I would go back and say, well, I wonder why that struck me at that time when I was reading it. Now, something that I do that Father Daniel does not agree with, but I do it, I do underline things in the Bible that I have. These are totally not until like, you can't do that. I'm like, I'm oh, sorry, I have to do it. Why? For myself, so that I can see, because it, all, it focuses me. Otherwise, I can get distracted. But if I'm looking for something out of every chapter, what is it that's gonna, that's here that catches my eye or catches my heart, hopefully, and then to, to underline it. And then what's really neat is that when I skim me through the Bible, you see these things. You're, I'm like, oh yeah, that's where that's from. So that's very helpful for me. Father Anne could do it without <laughs> doing any of that. I need to do that for myself. I need to do that for myself. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, yes. And so, in my season of life, is that if you don't have a good night's sleep, it's really hard to get up and praise in the morning when you're tired and you're dragging. So, but instead of saying, woe is me, I'm so tired, it is much better to praise God. 
Because when you do, you take your mind off of yourself, and you put it on someone else, onto God, which is the best, and ask for help. One of the things that also that I found is that if you notice in the canons of Old Five, the Edomos from Old Five, is usually about rising early at dawn. And so, if you're not a morning person, that's okay. Write them down when they when you hear them in the service or if you're following along. And then I, in my in my notebook, I've made a special like O5 section, so that when I don't feel like praying in the morning, I get up and I go through the O5 and they energize me. Talk all of these things that talk about rising early in the morning to pray. Of course, you have to do it. You know, so that's when like. It was fascinating about translation. This morning we read, we heard prayers, different translation that we use, yeah. and it makes you listen better. Oh, yeah. yeah. When you hear a different translation, and you're like, oh, okay, it gives you a different perspective. Like, it's the same concept, but it's different words. So you're like, okay, mm -hmm. and sometimes different words speak better to you at other times than others. So that's why I always need a reminder. So that's why the old five thing that really works for me. That really helps. Um, or there's Psalm 63, this beautiful, it says, O God, thou art my God, eagerly while I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh longs for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for thee in the sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory. Because thy, good, uh, thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus I will bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with merit and fatness and my mouth shall be praised thee with joyful lips. Oh, you know, when you're tired, and you read something like that, you're like, okay, well, time to get going. So, then when you hear all the confusion that are read in church, especially during first week, and these things come at you, they're familiar. Mm -hmm. And that really also is um, uplifting. So that's just little things about the fueling yourself, so then we can get actually the point of the talk, which is serving the church. So, if you've given yourself, what I find is that, of course, when you, if you start getting like into particularly here harried sections of life, and you're like, well, I don't really have time for this right now. I'll just do a quick version. That's all fine. But what's going to happen, I found, is that then you start flying off the handle a little more. You start saying things you shouldn't say, and and why is that? Because you haven't been fueling yourself. You haven't been filling yourself with the right things, and so the wrong stuff that's coming out of your, out of my simple heart, comes out instead of when you fill it with God's word. So um, that's why that's very important. And so then, after after fueling yourself, then of course it's who, serving your family, be it biological, be it your church family. Um, is that that would be like our next calling. That's really part of serving the church because our families are supposed to be a microcosm of, of the church and God's relationship to us. Um, so as women, and I don't know where I got this, I should have written down to give the person the credit, it's said to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. So you set whatever you have in your household. So. You can be blaming your kids, you can be blaming your husband, but guess what? You said it. So if you give in to that, if you give in to them screaming, give to them like doing whatever they're doing, you know, that's that's shame on you. Shame on me. Because we're making that choice. We're making the choice of not to curb it, not to help ameliorate the, whatever situation is going on. <clears throat> Uh, another thing that we talked about is that how words can nourish others or break them down. So ladies, be very careful. Be very careful. Because sometimes you'll just say things out of nervousness, not thinking, being flipped. Well, I could really hurt someone. And by nourishing someone and building them up and encouraging them, you're letting them become whom God wants them to be. And how beautiful is that? Then you have many more people working toward the greater good. Uh, so we have that. Yeah. And we can correct in part of our, our journeys as mothers, grandmothers, 
but we have to do it in a way that's encouraging and to be um, to be constructive. I would say to our, our boys, I would say, if you don't have any good to say to them, don't say it at all. Well, it's very easy to say that to kids, but then you have to you look at yourself like, if you're really good to say, don't be saying it. This doesn't help really the situation. I mean, how many times have you thought you're going to convince someone with your words? I have not been realized that that doesn't really work. So find, you have to find other tools to try to, to do that. And of course, we have Philippians 4, which is a beautiful thing. I mean, people who are Protestant probably know this. Uh, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So anytime you're having bad thoughts, it's really good to remember that. And as I look around, so we do have younger women, we have older women, that this is great. But as we get as we get with older women, we really need to be giving back. So this is really the last season that God has given me to do something in my life. And so I encourage the who's ever in that season to see it that way too. And I mean, I'm working right now, but yeah, we've been blessed. We had a wonderful prayer warrior in our church, in this Mission Parish, and as you both seem to know. And she was a woman of prayer. She truly was. And the things that she left behind, oftentimes we'd be driving to church, and she would say, oh, you know, I'm really not feeling well. I really wasn't going to come to church, but I'm coming to church, and all these woes. And, and I would say, you both know, like, you know, if I get to be that age, I'm going to remember everything you told me. I don't understand what you're telling me right now, but I'm sure it's true. <laughs> and I'll, I'll remember you be praying for you, thinking, yeah, you both know, that told me this was going to happen, and it's going to happen. But she would do things like, and I know we're all in different seasons of life, but she would really prepare for going to church the day before. Okay, and it would be like she'd choose her outfit because everything as you get older becomes more of a struggle. She would choose her outfit. She would get her candle money. She'd get her offering money out. If she had flowers in her garden, she would pick those, put them in the fridge so they're ready to go to church. She would have it all set and ready to go. She would have started her, she said, I can't get through my communion rule in one day, so I have to start on Wednesday. And she would do little pieces of it throughout. Uh, she would also bring, she read her praise in Slavonic. She would pick out words, she said, in prayers. I've been reading these prayers all my life, she would say. And she said, you know, and I don't really know what they mean. She would write them on a piece of paper, and she would bring it to Father. You know, on the way home from church, we would go through what, the, what do these words mean. And she would say, she would hit her head, and she says, all of these years, and I didn't think to ask. <laughs> I mean, you have to understand. She was just... She was a tiny little thing, right? And she would, before Great Lent, Forgiveness Sunday, Forgiveness Vespers, she would bend down. She, she could barely walk. She was like, I'm doing prestrations. I'm like, you I think that, you know, maybe you should do it. I'm doing prestrations. So she would bend down as little as she could before every single person. And as the young person who would do a prestration in no time, like, don't you think that would make absolutely... She didn't need to say anything. She was doing it for herself, but by doing it for herself, she was doing it for others around her. St. Seraphim says, save your soul and those around you will be saved. So it's examples like that. Um, and how we were treasure that when our mission closed, uh, we would go every other week to bring her communion. And then we made it into a more of a prayer service when we would go. And then we got her actually to read the gospel reading for the day. And that was precious because she, she never really read out loud in church. But she read the gospel reading, and then we would talk about it. Well, Father Daniel would give a sermon. A sermon, but he would explain the gospel. And she would sit there, and she would do this. She would say, all these years, and I didn't know the beauty in the gospels. Um, but what a beautiful thing was, there in her last, last years, she was truly a woman of prayer. 
and she brought it all together and she it was more of a blessing for us than it was going to her so what may have seemed that like oh yeah it, like it's a long drive you go it was a beautiful thing because she treated when father brought communion she treated him as though it was christ coming to her house and she would make sure that her daughter prepared a special uh, like little breakfast afterwards. I'm like, well, I like, I know her daughter's busy. I'm like, it was like, you don't need to do that. We we're totally fine, you know. No, it has to be done because in her, it wasn't so much the people; it was the idea of what the gift that she was granted, and she was going to do her very best to make sure that she showed reverence for that. And we had one. Um, person joined us once and they were going to be going to church after that and they came just like they were going to be going to work after that so not particularly Sunday best dressed <laughs> afterwards we come downstairs and she says says how are you dressed he says you just you're gonna have communion so you have to do better than that <laughs> <laughs> and you know Fortunately, but the woman was, you know, she can laugh, of course, she can laugh about it, you have to laugh about it. And Phil, please, you know, when someone does give you correction, do not take offense. You know, the, 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 I think it's good intentions, and this woman didn't. I mean, she could have been offended, but she wasn't. She, like, she says, she says, but now she says, I make sure that whenever I go to church, I am dressed properly. I don't see that. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's just little things like that. And what is that? And that's really one generation passing on to the next generation. And having been around that is a great blessing. And we may not even see it in ourselves, but young people, the young generations are watching. And it's how we live our life and the outreach that we have for others that ultimately is going to, hopefully, well, the grace of God, of course. But our job is to try to spread that grace to others that we meet. And it's not going off necessarily doing fantastic things. It's how do you treat your neighbor? You know? And sometimes we don't treat we treat our neighbors better than we treat our own families. So we need to be careful about that too. And then I love this operation. You're an older woman. Everyone here is an older woman to someone. So you can be in your twenties, you're an older woman to someone else. And it starts at a very young age to give guidance to someone who's younger. And so to younger people, I would say, ask of the older generations, because sometimes the older generation does, thinks you're not interested, and that cannot be the case. Or if you're older, listen, ask questions of the younger people. You know, you make assumptions of what they're going through, but you don't really know. You have to ask them. And you might find out that you can really pray for them, and they'll be grateful. Um, once the, the someone said to me, it's like, you know, the, the children went and asked advice from someone else and, then, and not the parents. And the, the mom was like, I thought I had a great relationship with my child, and they didn't come to me and ask me. And, uh, and she asked her daughter, and she says, well, why don't you ask me? And the daughter said, because I knew what you were going to tell me. I want to hear it from someone else. So they know. They know exactly where we stand. But sometimes you just need to get someone else's perspective on it, because everyone here has had a different journey. Everyone's had different crosses to bear. And that's why it's wonderful to come and to talk with everyone and to learn about what you've gone through and your experience, because you learn from everyone. And we all have our own way to God. We all have our own relationship with, with God, with our favorite saints that we have. Uh, and that is a beautiful thing, because a prescription for someone isn't necessarily someone else. But the Orthodox Church gives us a construct. Over the centuries, this is the construct, and it will help you advance. Because if you don't have the construct, if you don't have tradition, then what do you have? You're recreating wheel every time. <clears throat> and you'll have people who don't have traditions. Where were we? They don't have traditions, and they saw traditions, and they said, I've never had this in my family. And I, I, started, I didn't know what to say, because I'm so steeped in tradition, I don't even know that some people have no clue that there's tradition out there. So I have to be careful. Um, and sometimes just opening your door and talking to someone, you never know what's going to affect someone. Uh, so we have that. So, 
Oh yeah, and then one more thing about Lyubov Simonovna is that she would always write out her prayer requests. If one of her grandchildren was sick, if someone, if someone was having a name day, this or that, she would always ask, put a special petition for that person. And she wanted to know how she could pray. She was praying for her grandchildren. And one of the most important things that she did, she insisted that each grandchild gets a prayer book. And she included our boys with that too. And you know what? Our boys treasure that prayer book because she gave it and inscribed it. And she wanted to make sure that each of her grandchildren got a Bible. She says, they might not read it now, but you know what? They're going to know that that's what I wanted them to do. And that was her legacy. And that's what she did. So it's, it's how we, you know, we do it. And then, so after we've taken care of ourselves, we've taken care of our families, now I have to come and help the church. And there's plenty to do in the Orthodox Church. A priest once told Father Daniel, says, the Orthodox Church is predicated on manpower. So in other words, you need people to help. The, the church is a wonderful way. It appeals to all our senses, right? We have hearing, smell, taste, touch, all of those in the Orthodox Church. And some senses appeal to more others. Um, some, it will be, you know, you can, you can donate money, all of that's good. But there's always something that can be done. And a woman once shared with me, uh, she said her mom was a particular hard worker. And they all had trouble with money as they were growing up. There were four children. And her mother would do such acts of kindness that the daughter didn't even know until after the mother died. But she was the oldest in the family, and she said, she realized, like, Mom, how can I help you? I'm like, wow, that's pretty beautiful. Like, I would be, like, running away. <laughs> like, I can hide from my responsibilities. And um, her mom says, well, just look around. And the girl did, and she says, she's all pile of dishes in the sink, and she said, I started washing dishes. I washed dishes every single day. I washed so many dishes in my, in my day. <laughs> But she's really good at washing dishes now. And not only that, but when she told me, I really, uh, I smiled at that. And I said, you know, I said, that's a beautiful thing. The mom didn't say, you have to do this, this, and this. She says, look around. And that also is uh, more of giving your kids responsibility, right? Not to spoon feed them, but to say, okay, I've taught you what I can teach you. And kids can learn very early, and they can be helpful very early. Those of you that are on infants, and like even a year and a half when our, our second son was born as a newborn and our 18-month-old came into the hospital, that little boy was like an adult in comparison with <laughs> yeah. He could do so much at 18 months. It, it blew me away. I, you know, when you're with him, you don't realize it. But they can do a lot of things. They can do a lot of things. It's all on, on uh, the experience that you give them and what you show them. So... We have, of course, you know, support services at, at, at the church. We have chanters. We have lots of chanters here. That's beautiful. Um, you can always clean. So I would encourage you to look around. Because it's not just in the act of doing these things, but it's in how you, the approach that you take, if you do it to the glory of God, that changes your labor very easily, very quickly, because that changes your labor. And to remember that as you do it, that it's a gift that you're still able to do it physically because the time will come when you will not be able to do things physically. And it's hard to imagine when you're completely physically able, but when you see someone who has been physically able and just no longer, the time is coming. We just don't know when. We just don't know when. So there's always something to do. And we have a wonderful example. Maria's going to show us of what one what could do. Uh, of making prosperity it's something always nice. Everyone's very grateful to have prosperity at the end of a service. Uh, so that's another thing that, um, that can be done. And I'm sure that you all know that wherever you are, of the things, how you can help out. Some people have a gift for doing flower arrangements. Oh, and then, to inspire you, if you listen to the prayer behind an anvil, you won't hear it tomorrow because I think that the prayer for St. Basil is different. Uh, at the end of liturgy, when the priest comes out, after communion, said, he says, O Lord, bless, O Lord, who does bless them that bless thee, and sanctify them that put their trust in thee. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Preserve the fullness of thy church. Sanctify them that love the beauty of thy house. Do thou glorify them by the divine power.
power and forsake us not that hope in thee. Well, that's a prayer to anyone who does anything to help the church to keep its cycle of services going. Sanctify them that love the beauty of thy house. Anything that you do. Anything that you do. There's lots of things to be done. So I think with that, that's what I have. Well, I think we should open it up to questions. Okay. We have, we have the whole range here. Uh, singles, we have people who have little kids, we have people who have older kids, and I'm sure they, I would guess we have some questions. So we, we have a, a fount of wisdom here in Matshka, so I think it's a good opportunity, or even sharing with each other. I have experiences sure. for doing things. There's a lot of wisdom in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the monastic here, so I don't get to ask questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know I will, but <laughs> <laughs> I find someone else like that. I'd like to hear that again. Be the thermostat? No, no, be the, yeah, the, be the thermostat. Be the thermostat. Not the thermometer. Not the thermometer. Okay. Especially when you've got a bunch of kids. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Out. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can flip out right with them. Yeah. Or you choose not to do that. <laughs> it's a temptation. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. D one of new days getting wants to get in there. Yeah. Anything to destroy the peace. Yeah. Anything yeah. to destroy the peace. If we give into it, we give into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get down to their level. <laughs> oh, it's so easy to get there. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. It's so easy to get there. The, I would say, does anyone feel that their role as a woman is insignificant? It's a witch. It's <laughs> insignificant. Oh. You know that you don't feel that there's a role for you. Because you're not a deep in your Yeah, exactly. Or, or do you see that maybe it's not very humble, but I don't feel like that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, that's I, good. I, I have days that I feel um, the to-do list is for four or five people. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when I get to the end, I tend to look at what I didn't do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I decided about two years ago to work on this habit. I look at everything I've done, I'm like, okay, I did it for three people today. It's okay. <laughs> the other two can wait until tomorrow, the end of the week. Uh, I'm learning how to make it as a habit that if it didn't happen today, is not meant from God, it's not the time to happen today. It's just, it's in my head. It's definitely in my head, but it's not God's will to happen today. So, yeah. So, it's not a humble answer, but yeah. it's my answer. No, that's not yeah. hard to I found that, um, like in my generation, it was like, unless you had a job outside the house, you weren't anything. Like, if you say you're a housewife, they would just look down at you as like, that's nothing. As you said, that's, that's, still, that's still a thing. Pardon? That is still a thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But that was a switch in, in my generation. It was like, you know, you're you're more important if you had some sort of career. But don't you think it's beautiful that in the church we all have basically a career in the church in a way? Absolutely. Yeah. Whether you what's well, wonderful or sing or clean yeah. or talk. talk to people when you read the Psalms. What is it? Thirty one. You know what a woman is. Yeah. You know that's a very special. Yeah. 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 It switches it back to what. Because you're raising, the children are icons, mm -hmm. you know? They're reflecting Christ in the home that's raised, you know, they'll go out into the world and people will see them as to, you know, to further the faith. Yes. You know, they might not see an icon, but they'll see them. And so it's such a very special job. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah. The world. It's so important being a mother. I'm going to say only just because I hear from so many different people. What made me think is that someone might be feeling not so great right now. Well, gosh, my kids aren't going to church or they aren't doing this and the others are so ideal. <laughs> their, their kids go. But it's amazing. The prayer, I always say the prayer of a mother. Because you never know when that day is coming. The seeds that you plant is what, what you have to focus on. And how they'll turn out, you just keep praying. And at the end of the day, well, with God's help, to, even when it, things don't look so good sometimes, mm -hmm. then, but you, don't, you shouldn't give up. Yes. Well, even right. further than that, though, we may never see it. That's right. 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 Yeah. 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 Y
but that doesn't mean you don't do it. Right. But that's great too because mm -hmm. several people I've known <laughs> the parents weren't active in the church, but the grandparents or the great grandparents yeah. had been, and they were praying for these children. Mm -hmm. And even even after they're opposed, they're still mm -hmm. praying. Mm -hmm. And so you know these individuals are blossoming in the church, and maybe their families are blossoming in the church. So. Be patient, all in God's time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of the beauty of orthodoxy, too. It's not so concrete or material. It's a little bit different, but it reminds me of the story of Father Alexei Young. Mm -hmm. His mother was not orthodox, and she was dying. And they had been praying for her and praying to St. John, John. And so she's in her hospital bed, and it's the last few days before she's going to pass. And she, she grabs her son and she says, a little man came to me last night. And she described them, and it was St. John, you know? So, so those things that we don't see that are kind of invisible in a way, but sometimes do come for our, for our edification, to know that God and the saints are there. We don't always see this. So it's not like, it's not always so concrete. But if we pray, the saints are there, and they will help. Mm -hmm. Our right, boys were teenagers. I so want to give up. You know, they're just going through a stage where they were just bickering with each other. And just so, <laughs> like, you know what? Yes. You're, you're totally fine. Then you get to be in your teens and my life's gone up. <laughs> and I'm being so tired of this bickering. And I said to him, like, I'm just so tired of this. And she's, she looked at me and she says, you can never give up. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like okay, okay, I got it. That you can never give up. Like you want to throw in the towel, you're know, like, that's it, I'm done. Like, no, she said you can never give up. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. The one thing that um, makes me get through is the prayer that's made for the Theotokos, uh, the prayer of the mother avails the most of the master's favor. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I guess it gets them right. There's going to be days when you lose the battle, and sometimes you got to just get up and start again. You know, there's always those times where you might have said the wrong thing to your kids, or you can't despair. We have, we have the hope. We have hope. And I could pray for my kids that boys that are not in the church, that God will grant them repentance worthy of salvation before they depart this life. But even as they're departing, if they call out to God in repentance, they even hear the cry. They just always have the hope, even beyond our lifetime, you know, to hold on to that. I think, I'm sure there are many souls who do cry out in their realization, and I'm sure God's faithful to answer. Kids, uh, keep us praying. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the reason that they <laughs> they're so hard sometimes because when you, you think things are easy and you think that you've got it, then you get a little lax. Or I, I get a little lax. And it's like my husband always tells me because I stress out about our daughter a lot. She, my, our daughter is also um, no, not going to church at this time. And my husband says, Did you ask? God to take care of this and you need to get out of the way. Uh, what can I do? You can't do anything. You can't do anything. Did you ask God to take this? Then you get out of the way. Your job is to pray. Your job is to be over there praying because you're not teaching her anymore. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you covered all the topics in such a beautiful and very smooth transition from starting on. <clears throat> that uh, if we don't have the spiritual fuel, there is nothing we can give. And it's so true because everything, women, everything spins around us in the house, yeah. really. And uh, I find myself many, many times not sleeping well. You even covered that. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening and I'm thinking, you know, of course, consistency and everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, when I wake up, and I don't really want to wake up because I didn't even sleep, I didn't even go. Yeah. And you even covered that. Absolutely. Amazing, really. So uh, I do struggle with mornings like that. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I wake up, I'm like, oh my goodness, what is the to-do list? And then I, thank God I have a small, and I just moved. I need to put that back by my bed. St. Elizabeth, St. Barbara, and I turn on like, and this is a habit that started in my mid-twenties, and we're talking about habits. Yeah. And even when I have nights that I didn't sleep, 
this morning was St. Pantelemon in your house. <laughs> I turn around and I make three bows and I say, Glory be to you, dear God. Glory be to you. Glory be to you. Give me power to go through the day, please. And I know um, I want what I don't want. My daughter is watching me. It doesn't matter if I sleep or I didn't sleep. That's she absorbs. Mm -hmm. And yes. she, will, she will absorb only until she leaves me. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And after that, she. I, I cannot bring her home, sit down here, right. and observe me now right. because it just came to me. No. She observes me and she picks up everything, good or bad. Yes. So, in those days when I'm tired and it's hard, this is actually something that brings the motivation back that she observes me, and I want she really to take of her out in the world the best. Mm -hmm. Whatever that the best means. So, Beautiful. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That yeah. was thank just you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Do people need any practical examples? Or like, now I just thought about, you know, I grew up in a new calendar family, and. My dad was a priest, but we were very modern and very good. But we actually did have not a prayer corner, but a little prayer hall. And I actually have now, it was so a, an icon my father had bought when he was a young man in Greece, and, and that was like in the family spot, the corner. And when we were very little, we did our prayers together. And then it sort of fell away, but at least there was something that planted that seed. And I'm just wondering how hard it is today for families um, to say, you know, we're going to have a prayer corner and we're going to try, at least especially when they're young, to build that habit of doing prayers together. Because I see that's the most critical thing, but sometimes it's the toughest thing to actually um, create in the family. Yes. <laughs> and I, I could say something else, but I won't. I'll leave it open to you about how you manage to make that work or not work in a family to sort of build those habits. I can, I'll start, but um, we did. We do say prayers in the evening together. We've begun saying prayers in the morning on our own, so I just say when you wake up, the first thing you do. Mm -hmm. So that no one's waiting on each other, we start doing that. But in the evening, now that my children are older and they're in all these activities, it's a late night. Mm -hmm. we don't, we don't, but you make it a point to have But end. everybody knows that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard. And there are some nights that we've had to say, you know, well, these guys are going to say their prayers in the car on the way home and we're just going to go because there's something else going on, of course. But mostly, they just know. It's time for evening prayers. And I do usually stop, oh, I'm still doing this, and I'm still doing it, and everybody's getting together. And it's chaotic. It is chaotic. But even though we are so exhausted, we be now that we've made it a point for so long, it's become... Nobody, nobody fights about it. They just know. And then when we, even if we start first and people are angry with each other, we usually end at peace. So we might be exhausted. I might want to just come home and get in my jammies and go to bed and like everybody leave me alone. But I can't do that. And it, it helps in the in the end. So yes, it's very difficult once they're all we're all starting to be in separate directions. But I think if well, we've found it, personally it's, it's, that when we force it's it together. difficult when you're older, but to start the habit at the beginning, you know, you're a young couple and oh, well, this isn't so important, and, get, and then you never get to it, <laughs> get to that point where you've yeah. made the habit of having prayers together as a family at any time. It's definitely easier if you start early on. When we were first married, we didn't always say our prayers mm -hmm. together, even mm -hmm. though people advised us to. That was the hardest thing to do. Because who's bossing who? Sorry. Well, no, it's not the exact. Well, you know, it's <laughs> not the well, in a Pray few minutes. <laughs> prayer was a very quiet thing. And yeah, only yeah, you do yeah. it by yourself or with your family. Yeah, but, still. but now you're married to someone else and you got to right. say them together. I'm like, I don't want to say prayers with you. <laughs> right? You know? It's different. Yeah, it's different. It was, it was almost hard. easier once we had the kids to say it. we're saying that's prayers with right. our family. That's right. And we did start with our kids. We didn't do all of the prayers no. together. Yeah. We did yeah. little modified, sure. you know, just this him yeah. and then yeah. make grew, 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 grew. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it is. It's just making the habit. It making make the, the habit, habit, like you said, yeah. it is definitely mm -hmm. easier. I, I can say now my girls do say their prayers on their own, there are certain mm -hmm. ones that they that they say by themselves, yeah. even, um, which is really 
I'm really grateful for it. Too. Well, and the other things help too, right? If they go to camp or you make other relationships and they get to help them build up. But I'm not the only kid. Yeah, we've been seeing, we seeing some different prayers since they went to camp. Then they want to come home and do it the way they do it at camp. Oh, and then the other kids were more likely to join way, in, right? Oh, no, no, let's do it this way, Mom. Instead of the way I do it, let's do it. This is how we did it at camp. And then I found that the siblings were more interested in that in that way of doing it because they have it in camp and they've got other experiences tied to it. And other, I think, spiritual experiences tied to it. Don't you think? I mean, and it's not just my parents. It's not just my parents. It's somebody else that's yes. done this, given an example. Yes. Right. And that really helps having the community. And, yeah. and then they have to make yeah. it their own. And that's yes. the way they do it. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, they have to learn to pray on their own. Wanna add to that what about you? That you? I just want to add to it. Um, I found myself many times in the evening before screaming prayer time. And yeah, I just read the one on one on one day. My grandfather from my mom's side was the Russian bell ringer at the church. Uh -huh. wow. And and one day somehow somehow it, it just okay, if the bell rings at the church, everybody knows that they put their church clothes on and go. Mm -hmm. So I got one of those bells. Mm -hmm. You probably didn't get to experience that when you're at my house, because everybody knew mother I got this. <laughs> but I did, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to start the incense in the chapel. We have a little house chapel. Uh -huh. And then if I don't see anyone moving, I get that bell out, it's small, and I literally ring from the chapel. Even the dog comes. <laughs> Even my dog knows that this is it. We are all, and then I hear everybody walking. My mom lives with me after the divorce. So everybody is all angry, not angry, but the bell helps. And it helps me to not say anything. It's the bell that is calling you. That's it. It's not me. So this is a habit that we started years ago, and it actually helps. It helps to keep the voice down. I like that. I like that. Exactly. Time for prayer. Exactly. Yeah, you're not ready? Come yeah, on! Exactly. Oh, it's it's you're not ready? Just jump down, you know? Like, get over here! No, it's it's the bell. <laughs> the bell's coming. I like that. Thanks. Lisa, what about in your, oh, in your walk? You're asking me? Yeah, I am. Well, I think you should. Yeah. Sure, you have a five. Thank you. Have. Uh, well, what do you want to know? Well, <laughs> just think of what you might want to share with the group. I have a lot. Well, I have two different lives. One life past and one life moving forward. Oh, that's important. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, I, I did grow up in a Russian Orthodox family, obviously. My dad became a priest only in his 50s. He was a late... But he was involved in the church. But he was always involved in the church. He was a church warden. Uh, then he became a deacon. And then he started serving in the synod. And then he got his own parish in Astoria, New York, Holy Trinity. And my parents were married about 56 years. Um, big parish, as Mother Gabby knows. Um, and, and you live right next to the church. Yeah, I mean, I, I was married at one time and divorced, didn't have kids. I came back to Astoria because I wanted to be near the church. Because the person I lived with didn't want to be part of the church, so. Um, part times and so I came back and became the church uh, the choir director and you know slowly but surely you know you started developing your skills but at the time you didn't really understand it for what it really is because you took advantage of it because you always had it in front of you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I grew up with bishops at that table almost every week and just like you have just like some of us have but we take it for granted, as I did. And so when my dad passed, you know, other things took place in the church, and it kind of opened my eyes. I think somebody from above literally just showed me and said, it's time to wake up, because your Orthodox faith is very important. So it taught me to start really praying a lot deeper. Because you're in pain, right? And so I have now my own little room, a little room with my prayer room. So mom and I, because we can't make it in a week, 
to church because it's about an hour drive. We both don't drive because we come from a big city. But that's okay. We can make it once a month. But we do have our prayer services because I have all the books. Now I really treasure them. You know. And so we do what we can. And we like to come for these retreats. But, you know, you have to kind of initiate it at one point. Because like you said, you know, you can't become lazy. You can. And so for me, that was my kind of journey. It's still going. But it's become more positive. It's, I see the sun more often, let's just say. I used to see a lot of darkness. So, but I would say it's going well. Because of Father Daniel and Malushka, we traveled to North Carolina. Yes, we had our pilgrimages. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you realize after you know a while how much you had in your past, yes. and how much you can take advantage of it yes. when you see it being taken from you. You know, so when we travel, he came at a perfect time, Father <coughs> Daniel Malushka, because we were feeling really low. We felt very alienated very alone. Even though we were still going to church, it's just the idea that you're no longer living close to your church. There's no easy access anymore. And so it kind of forces you to look at things a little differently. So you lose your community also. So being in the community in the story, we lost it. So you have to now start a new community. And they're part of it. And all you too. Yeah. How you value how you value the services now that you're Oh my. Oh my. Well, first of all, I always had Slavonic services. Because my dad couldn't do English. She just had a big accent. And so, if I, you know, since I grew up on Slavonic, as I know a lot of my friends, they all sort of didn't understand it. Oh. The language. Oh yeah. Okay, interesting. And so we're, like, we're ashamed to even come out and say, can you please explain this to me? Mm -hmm. And so, now, when I started going to Fairfax to Father Andrew's church, because he does it half and half, half Slavonic, half in English, and you really feel like something has awakened in you, and you just don't want to go back that road. You want to go forward. And um, it's, it's been a journey. What a beautiful one. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, as someone, so I converted, but um, as a, at, a, at a young age, and I wonder for someone who has always been in the church and like you're saying, not really understanding that, what awakens that in you? What, you know, if you, you, I wonder like how much of my children, I try to explain things to them, but are they going to go through this journey and it, is it their own or not? And what is it that will help them to make it their own? So for, in your case, can I ask, what was it that woke you up? God is great, right? He's the decider in everything. And he loves me, I know he did. And I see he still does. My dad's death, as one of you knows. I think the suffering. The suffering. Mm -hmm. it, actually yeah. brought it brought good. me into that idea of repentance. Okay. It's time to repent. It's time. Yeah. Well, it's in the cradle orthodox, we take our, like there's the number of converts here, and it's like, yeah. you went through something and you knew you were missing something, so you really value orthodox. Right? Yeah. You grew up in the faith, you take it for granted. This is where I went, this is what I did, and you yeah. didn't even think about the prayers, but then I think the answer is God hits you, yes. and you either accept it or you don't. You could have taken that suffering and said, the heck with the church, exactly. the heck with yeah. all of it. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so I don't so want to like come to the church. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just touches your heart. Yeah. 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 And he's always there. Yeah. 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 But it's our yeah. prayers that help. Yeah. Yeah. The night that was in it. It's always your To give you the yeah. opportunity. Yeah. 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 You yeah. think yeah. the prayers of others Absolutely. are more beneficial to that person? Especially the parents, moms, and fathers, definitely. I mean, I don't want to live my life in regret. But I could live it now through with mom, with prayer services, and really understanding it for what it is. Uh -huh. and, value it. and value it more, yeah. Because he's giving me another opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I could have gone this way. I was at a crossroads. It was a four, yeah. It was yeah. a fork in the road. It was cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it told, it told me that 
day. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you got to do this or that, otherwise I'm not letting you in. Yeah. Mm. So you feel the door is slowly closing in on you. So you got to do some work, which is compassionate deeds, you mm -hmm. know, prayers. I mean, it's it changes everything. It changes your whole life. Yeah. And I know Mother Gabi knew, she knows me. Mm -hmm. She knows a totally different person from back then. It's changed me completely. Mm -hmm. Thank God. I think we're already running a little bit late, so now we're going to continue on. So practicals, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.